It's time for the Reader's Almanac with Warren Bauer. Originally broadcast over station WNYC New York and distributed by National Educational Radio, the Reader's Almanac is America's oldest continuous book program. Here now is Mr. Bauer. During the many years of this program, I have been especially interested in first books by new writers who came fresh to the literary scene. There's something stirring about making one's own personal discovery of a writer who has a voice of his own, a writer from whom one expects much in the future. I remember that I felt so when, in 1938, I came upon Richard Wright's Uncle Tom's Children, a book of stories, and interviewed him on this program. And again, I had that feeling when, in 1945, I read a first novel called Focus by a young writer named Arthur Miller, who has done other things quite different since then. I have such a feeling now after reading a first novel called Go Down Dead by Shane Stevens, just published by William Morrow and Company. This is a very different novel from those two, but this is 1967, and much has happened in America and to our literature in more than 20 years. This is a novel of our time, rough and brutal as is life in Harlem, or parts of it at least, and the language is rough as well. This we can take in stride now, Perhaps we are not wholly shock-proof, but when readers recognize truth, handled with fidelity, understanding, and compassion, they do not shrink from tragedy and hatred. A Go Down Death is a story of Harlem, as fresh as today's newspaper, as tough as what happens on its streets. Its chief character is a 16-year-old boy named King Henry, who succeeded to the presidency of the Playboys, a street gang, in competition with the Tigers, a white gang, and their natural enemies, of course. The structure of the story is that enmity and several incidents leading to a sort of ritual battle, a formal encounter between the two gangs. The result of that battle is the death of several of the members of each club and chiefly of the president of the Playboys. But woven into this story, told in the Argo of Harlem Streets by King Henry, is a panorama of Harlem life and characters that is frank and naturalistic in the extreme. What goes on in Harlem school makes up the down staircase seem a fable of purest ray by comparison. And what is the reality behind storefronts and apartment house portals is a shocking revelation of urban deterioration on all levels. Now Shane Stevens, the white author of Go Down Dead, was born 28 years ago. He was educated in Hell's Kitchen schools and in Columbia University. He has been a traveler by a tramp steamer to Mexico, to Hong Kong, to Cuba, and has had a wide variety of jobs, such as working on the Hoboken docks, to bartending and running the elevator in the morgue of a city hospital. He has lived in several cities, San Francisco and New Orleans among them, as well as New York. Now that, Mr. Stevens, is what I know of you from having read the blurb on the jacket of your book. I'd like to know a lot more, particularly I would like to know when you began to write and how it came about. Oh, well, Mr. Bowers, I, uh, I started writing this uh, novel in 1960. Uh, I could begin, I suppose, by saying that uh, back as far as I can remember, I've been living with uh, Negroes and uh, Jews and uh, Italians, mostly in the Hell's Kitchen, at least the uh, Hell's Kitchen of years ago. And uh, one thing I always, uh, from earliest, uh, awareness as far as I can remember, the one thing I was always fascinated by was the dynamism of the uh, Negro, the black man's language. And so about 1958, when I was at Columbia, I got the idea of living in Harlem and seeing exactly what is going on there. And I lived on 128th Street and Park Avenue for uh, three years through the end of 1960, and uh, trying to get background and the material going out with the kids uh, seeing what's, uh, what's happening on the streets. And it was about mid-1960 when I actually started putting words down. And it took about six years, was finished about June of 66. Uh, Does that six years mean that there were a lot of difficulties involved uh, in, uh, let's say, teaching yourself writing, perhaps? Uh, more getting research, I would think, uh, hope, hope anyway, than, uh, than the actual writing of the uh, book, although certainly I learned a lot with the first one, and I hope whatever is wrong with the first one will be better with the second. Well, there's not very much wrong in my eyes, believe me. I, I had wondered, you see, if you had made any uh, general attempts at something shorter, let's say a short story 
which might have grown and grown and possibly be, have become this particular novel? No, from the very beginning, my idea was to do a novel about the scene in Harlem. And of course, when one says Harlem, one is really saying every place in the country where the black man uh, is located. So it started from the very beginning as a novel and uh, finally worked itself out. How did you choose Harlem? Is it simply the place where things are happening and where the deterioration, social deterioration, is probably the worst? I think so. I think uh, I have been to Watts. I've been to uh, Atlanta, Georgia. I've been to Greenwood, Mississippi. I've been to Frisco. Uh, but I would say in Harlem I have found at least uh, things that I never expected to find, things that I thought uh, had been done away with hundreds of years ago. Yeah, I, I would say, in my opinion, Harlem is the worst, at least in the United States, that I have found. This is a place where uh, things are likely to be happening hereafter, the kind of thing that you've referred to as the revolution. Yeah, they'll, they'll be... Uh, I think the white man is going to be very much surprised in, uh, in years to come uh, as far as uh, things that are going to happen in Harlem. The, the black man is not going to... Uh, Take th after 300 years of uh, slavery, he's not going to take this nonsense that uh, the people in Washington are calling the great uh, Negro, so-called Negro Revolution. Uh, it looks good on paper, the Civil Rights Bill, but uh, economically, socially, politically, nothing has been done for the Negro. Probably he is in a worse state now economically and socially than he was uh, in 63 or 60 or as far back as, as you want to go. Uh, there are plans right now for having, for want of a better term, a revolution. I think the black man is waiting for a leader. He had a leader in Malcolm X, but unfortunately uh, he was destroyed. Some people, I myself included, believe by the white man, or at least through the machinations of the white man. There was another leader named Robert Williams uh, who was drummed out of the country on false kidnapping charges. He is now down in Cuba, just returned from China, I believe. Uh, he was a charismatic leader, is today, but is not, uh, certainly will not be found in the United States until uh, the revolution occurs. You're looking for altogether different types of leaders than Martin Luther King, let us say, I gather. Martin Luther King, I think most black men will agree, uh, started out well, but is an Uncle Tom. Mm -hmm. Well, now, uh, I'd like to, those are fascinating things. You're making predictions that, uh, well, not actual predictions, but something very close to it. That's fascinating, but I'm doing this uh, interview on your book because I regard this as enormously important and highly readable and I want a lot of people to get to read it. So I'd like to have you talk about it. I wonder if the fact that, as I've referred to, or just as a matter of, of pure fact, that you are the, a white author of a book about the Negroes, I wonder if that made any particular difficulties uh, for you. Or do, have you so associated yourself with the people that you have come to know in Harlem that uh, it seemed as natural to write about them as if there was no uh, breach between you at all. Yeah, there, uh, as far as I'm concerned, there was no breach, uh, certainly in my years up there, and I'm still up there today and hope to be up there for many years to come, uh, Harlem and places like it. Uh, there certainly were people, mostly young people, who uh, uh, looked askance at a white man uh, coming into Harlem trying to find out what makes them tick, seeing uh, at least some of them getting the feeling that they were uh, put on a pedestal. But for the most part, uh, once I identified with them, uh, trouble seemed to uh, disappear. How did you gain their confidence and get within their trust? Well, the only way, I'm not sure trust is the right word, the, the only way one could be with a group of people is to actually be there, and this is for instance, this is why the caseworker approach to welfare, for an example, will not work. The only way one can be with a group is to actually live on the streets. Now, Vista is beginning to find that out now. And for the first time, again, talking about Harlem and my years up there, for the first time, 
as far as I can see, in the history of what is going on in Harlem, white people are actually beginning to live on the blocks to deal in the white man's grocery store, to get charged more at the local supermarket, more, let's say, more money for a given item, food item, than perhaps on East 57th Street. Uh, at the very beginning, there was a certain amount of trouble uh, with between me and uh, groups of uh, Harlem youth up there uh, because I would come up uh, only for weekends. And then when I found out that this wasn't working and I began living up there uh, and experiencing what they experienced from the man downtown, from what they call just the man, meaning the white man, uh, everything kind of changed. Of course, I never told them naturally that I am considering writing any kind of a novel about them, although they knew that I was there for more than just social work. Yes, that would have ruined your association with them, probably. I think with, uh, with some of them. Uh, as an example, King Henry, uh, really the character, the things that happened to King Henry uh, were taken from a 16-year-old Harlem youth uh, whom I identify at the beginning of the book as Jingo. He did live there. He did go through much, if not all, of what one reads in my book. And he did die of an overdose of heroin at the age of 16 back in uh, 1962. I can begin to see already, of course, that you've made a great many changes in, in Jingo's life and transforming him into King Henry. And this, in other words, it's a real work of fiction. It is not a documentary. No, no it's, a, it's a work of fiction. Uh, I hope the imagination is there. I hope the reader will find it. But the despair, the, uh, the utter hopelessness of the situation in Harlem is one that uh, the white man simply cannot believe until he actually lives there, not to go there for a weekend along Lenox Avenue or 125th Street, but to live uh, under the railroad tracks and to see the degradation that is being uh, uh, brought upon these people. Now, I'd like to get into some rather perhaps more literary matters. I wonder what led you into making the choice of casting your story into the, thir the first person, the hero telling his own story, you see, uh, as if he had an audience around him listening. Did you make a conscious decision or did you just haul off and write in that fashion? No, uh, again, this, uh, the answer has to be some, something along political lines. Uh, from the very beginning, I got the idea that people will simply not believe what is being written about or what I had hoped to write about unless it was an actual Negro speaking. And this uh, coalesced, I suppose, with uh, my own feeling for a literary style that the immediacy in a novel is what makes it remembered and, uh, and what makes it uh, head and shoulders over, over uh, in my opinion, third-person novels. So both, I think, the political and the literary things uh, got together, and that was it. Well, that's the best kind of decision to arrive at, of course. Uh, I had a feeling, you see, that you gained a particular sense of reality to have this young man with an awareness of, of his power uh, over a number of other young fellows, speaking out as he really felt and as he would, or as Jingo uh, actually did. Well, uh, that, that's, uh, that's true, certainly. Uh, what it amounts to, I guess, is that you have this boy using language, dynamic language, that uh, is not readily understandable by others, and were it to be put in the third person, uh, strictly from a literary or punctual viewpoint, I, w I would suspect that it would never appear in print uh, the way it ought to be, the way it is heard. And so, the, again, the only logical conclusion was to do it in a speaking voice, and again, we get back to the first person. Did you have any doubt at all that this would be read uh, properly, let us say, by your readers? so that it would be, to, it would represent to them actual and authentic Harlemese? Well, I think that's where some of the shock comes in, although I didn't plan on that at the beginning. Uh, I, I feel from my experience that the words that the black man uses today, the white man downtown will use six months from now, and the words that the white man uh, are using, is using now, 
uh, will be, uh, has been used six months before by the black man and has been forgotten. So that again, the immediacy of the words uh, was the one thing I wanted to do with the book. And, uh, well, I hope I've, uh, I've succeeded. Well, you certainly have, uh, very much so. In fact, this leads me to another problem, which I'm sure that you met and very early too. Now, the talk in such a life gets pretty gamey. Yeah. Did you have to restrain your character somewhat to bring his talk into a book? To be mm -hmm. sure, an author now has more freedom than he had 10 years ago. Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't have to change anything, uh, either in my mind or in the book itself. The way it's written is the way they're talking, and uh, I would think that the white reader, after the first 10 or 20 pages based on his, ex his own experiences, I would think he'd be able to get into the book. Certainly I've had people say that uh, it took them as many as 50 pages, but no one yet at least has come to me and said uh, it was throughout not understandable. No, it certainly isn't that at all. It seems to me one adjusts very quickly indeed. Uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, rises up off the page and you hear it, you don't read it really. Uh, it is that uh, realistic. And at the same time, there's a kind of poetry in it. Now, uh, some readers are not going to find that at all, of course. Yeah, They're going to be yeah. I've met those readers already. Yeah, who resent the, the gamey words that uh, uh, we all know about and, ex and do not expect to find them on the page of a book, even now. But there they are. This is, this is life as it is lived. Uh, I well, get that impression at any rate, although I don't know Harlem at all. Well, uh, yeah, much of what, what you say is right in this sense that uh, many readers pick up a book and they think uh, this may be good for fireside reading, but the world is moving very fast and I, for one, I, susp I suppose, don't have time for fireside reading. What I want to do, what I set out to accomplish, was to write something about what actually is happening today in the way it is happening and in the words that are... Uh, being used today, and for those readers who believe the novel should be more than just a, a fireside chat, uh, I think they uh, they will find something in this, uh, whether their experience has been in Harlem, near Harlem, or in any black man's ghetto. I want to go back to that idea of it's being, a, a, in a measure, a, a sort of documentary. Leave King out of it. I think he's a creation, all right enough. But the, the background, uh, what goes on on the Harlem streets, in a sense, that is documentary. It has to be, I should think, because it's real and, and whole. Uh, so would you agree that there is at least a documentary flavor to the background of your novel? Yes, certainly. Nothing that's in the book has not happened. Nothing that's in the book is not happening right now. And as a matter of fact, much that is not in the book uh, that, again, hopefully will appear in in my second novel, which I'm uh, into about 10,000 words now, much of what I didn't put in the first book will be in the second one. Things that are still to come, things that uh, I'm afraid uh, will be very disconcerting mm -hmm. to the white man. Is the major part of Harlem organized in youth gangs such as the Playboys and the Tigers, just for example? Not any longer. What is happening now is that, actually, there, there have been two new influences coming in. One is uh, drug traffic. Uh, I don't mean to sound paranoid, but it seems from living in Harlem for any amount of time, one does get the impression that the drug traffic in places like Harlem is so well organized, again, through the white man, that many of these youths, because of utter, complete, hopeless despair, are turning to drugs. Now, once this happens, and this is happening more and more today, once this happens, the whole organization of a gang falls apart, so that today you are having more and more of three and four uh, gang people um, breaking away from their uh, milieu and, uh, for instance, attacking people rather than 20 and 30 and 40 member gang structures. Mm -hmm. Does your scene of the making of stag movies have a counterpart in real life Harlem? Is this a part of the documenting of Harlem? Yes, it is. Several years ago, this was taking place in Harlem, again, because uh, 
I suppose being white or black, one needs money to live on. Uh, I don't pretend to know the reason that much of this type film is being, or at least was being done in Harlem, but uh, it again has a, a factual basis, yes. Mm -hmm. And of course, New York seems to be a great market for this kind <laughs> of film. I'm afraid it is. The Rumble has its counterpart too, I'm sure, in real life. A, a wider counterpart, or I thought too, as I read of the ritualistic behavior of the two sides as they sit together in a war council that is a virtual declaration of war. The presidents don't talk, King was saying. Uh, this is a, a ritual, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, I, I think, uh, as uh, one of the characters in the book said, perhaps King Henry, although I don't remember uh, exactly, uh, they are living a life, at least on the streets, that is as rigid as any West Point graduate has ever faced. Again, this is a part of the overall problem that I think the white man simply does not uh, grasp or perhaps does not want to grasp. I thought of international conclaves, you see. Uh, here are the, the, the black gang on one side and the white gang on the other. There's just as sharp differences as would be found on the international scene, only uh, much more dramatic probably. And they were talking in exactly the same kind of way. They were, the words were different to be sure, but it was all ritualistic and laid down for them. They were acting um, ritualistically, that's all I could say, I think. Well, they, uh, those who have television, watch television, they see what is going on, and of course every youth wants to emulate his elders. Unfortunately, the only elders he sees on television, hears on his radio, are white men, and much uh, of what one reads in the book has been learned by these youths uh, through the uh, mass media, which is completely controlled and dominated by the white man. Now, one question, final question, I guess. Uh, death was inevitable for King, was it? Is this, in other words, a real tragedy, almost in the classical sense? You must have uh, wondered about that, how you're going to end this. You ended it magnificently, I think. Uh, but it does end with the death of King, and I just wondered if you felt that inevitable. Yes. Uh, to me, I suppose as to most people, there are many kinds of death, and one of them is despair. And King's symbolic death at the end of this work uh, can be translated into real life living on 128th Street and Park Avenue, uh, as an example. Uh, can be translated into a kind of mental and spiritual and certainly economic death where uh, they simply can't do anything more than uh, uh, barely exist. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shane Stevens, for underlining some of the things that readers of Go Down Death are going to experience as they read your book. It's a harrowing experience to live that life as fully as one does in this book. But since it is art of a high order, it has its compensations for every reader. I have not read so powerful a novel for years. Naturally, I urge serious readers to take up this book. It will be shocking in a deep sense, but as deeply rewarding. You've heard Warren Bauer and author Shane Stevens as they discussed the book, Go Down Dead. This was another program in the series, The Reader's Almanac. On our next program, Mr. Bauer's guest will be Ladislas Farago, author of the Broken Seal. The Reader's Almanac is produced by Warren Bauer and is originally broadcast by station WNYC, New York. The programs are made available to this station by National Educational Radio. This is the National Educational Radio Network.